Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. Tracy, you want to talk about food a little bit? (laughs) I love to talk about food. Uh, this isn't so much about food as it is about the people that make food. We will talk about some food along the way. Uh, today, no secret, there's a whole entire industry around celebrity chefs. And often they'll start on TV, but then they tend to branch out. So today there are so many chefs with branded cookware lines and food lines and endorsement deals. And, you know, their restaurants are well-known throughout the world and people go to see them. And their faces on the outside sometimes. Yeah, Like, being a celebrity chef is a thing now. Uh, But the first celebrity chef, it might surprise you to learn, was around long before uh, Farnsworth ever conceived of the television, which launches most celebrity chefs today. And to find said chef, we actually have to take a a peek all the way back at late 18th century France and the life of Marie-Antoine Carême. Uh, 18th century France is the source of so many trends. It is, and I will confess it's one of the areas of history that I love, so yeah. uh, that's why you're getting it today. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's it's incredibly incredibly possible that there are also famous chefs in other parts of the world, but this was mm-hmm. the one that like took it to a whole other level. Yeah, certainly in the Western world, this is definitely the first celebrity chef. So we are talking about Marie-Antoine Carême, who was born in a slum in Paris on June 8th, 1783. His family was massive, and it was also destitute. He was the 16th child in the family and was named after Marie Antoinette. This is a little bit of a weird choice for a baby name at this point. Marie Antoinette was not beloved by this time, but uh, the reasoning for why his parents decided to name him after her is not clear. What is clear is that soon after he was born, he was being called by Antonin instead of Marie Antoine. And then throughout his life, he would shift among various uh, combinations of his name. Yeah, at one point, like, there are instances where he's referred to as Marc Antoine, even. Um, The name Antoine gets moved around a little bit. And because he was born to a very poor family at a time when France was deeply unstable... It wasn't long before Antonin was abandoned. And it's unclear exactly why, but this is Carême's account of his abandonment as dictated to his secretary, Frédéric Fayot. Quote, his father, with 15 children, was a prey to a very painful poverty. This man was frequently intoxicated, perhaps out of disgust with life, and his irregularities of conduct increased the misery and sorrows of those whom he had to feed. One day, when he returned before dinner, he took his young son with him. They went to the fields. After the walk, they returned to dinner at the main barrier. That's the gates of France. And when the meal was over, the father spoke of the future to the poor child and urged him to part with his family. Quote, go, child, go well. In the world, there are good trades. Let us languish. Misery is our lot. We must die there. This time is that of beautiful fortunes. It is enough to have wit to make one, and you have it. Go, little one, and perhaps this evening or tomorrow, some good house will open for you. Go with what God has given you. These words, which are almost remarkable in the mouth of this simple workman, always resounded in the ears of Karem. Forty years after having heard them, he still had before his eyes the bitter face of his father. The young Karem was left in the street, literally. He did not see his parents again. His father and his mother died young. His brothers and sisters were scattered. Uh, It's almost like he is leaving a dog in the woods and claiming that he has set it free. Very much so. Uh, And... At this time, there was a lot of street violence in Paris, and children were not immune to it. So this seems just bizarrely optimistic in this idea that he's just going to go and immediately find a good place. Yeah, and we'll talk about this story in just a second. Uh, Because according to Karem, he was offered a bit of good fortune when he was taken in almost immediately by a cook who let him do menial tasks around the kitchen and home in exchange for room and board. And we honestly don't know if this or that story about his father is entirely true. These are Karem's stories of his own life, and each of them became part of his mystique and was told by him and then his students and his clients for years and years. 
He did have a kitchen apprenticeship as, as a boy that started sometime in 1793. And at this point, France was having sort of an identity crisis in terms of its cuisine, which was running parallel with the French Revolution. So the sentiment toward the royals became increasingly negative, and there was this impulse in a lot of professional kitchen, kitchens to really get away from the rich, indulgent food that was associated with the royalty into a lot simpler fare. But simultaneously, fine food was a big part of French identity, and there were other cooks who were not willing to give that up, nor were they willing to give up the delicious food that they personally loved to eat just because they were fed up with royalty. Yeah, and you have to trace some of this back to Louis XIV, uh, who had made kind of a conscious decision that what France was going to be known for was luxury and the finest of everything. So this is something that had been ingrained already and had been established, and then to go, no, no, we hate the royals now, and we don't want to uh, include luxury in our cooking in this way, uh, was a, a big sea change to try to enact. And of course, it was a little bit controversial. And I want to put food culture of this period in a little bit more context. So cafes at this time, literally meaning like where you would go to get drinks, uh, had been common in Paris throughout the 18th century. But it wasn't until the late 1700s that restaurants, in the sense that we think of them now, popped up. So starting in the 1760s, there were places to get restaurants, those were soups. Uh, the word restaurant came from the root restaure, which means to restore. And these soups were believed to be almost medicinal in nature, intended to restore the body's vigor. And from there, that concept evolved so that the soup served began to be seen less as a curative and more as a food and something to just be enjoyed. And so too did the word restaurant evolve to become the place and not just the soups. And then, of course, to include other menu offerings. As a devotee of soups, <laughs> I am behind this. Well, you would have loved Karim because he was obsessed with soups, uh, and his soup recipes are the stuff of legend. <laughs> so in the context of the politics of the day, the so-called restaurant soups were considered health food of a sort. They were associated with the common man, and then cuisine par excellence, which were the, dec the decadent dishes that wealthy people favored, that was considered to be unwholesome and intended to encourage gluttony. So there was this whole morality element in play in denouncing the rich foods that the aristocracy favored. I think this still exists today. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and in 1782, just before Carême was born, the book Histoire de la Vie Privée, des Français, which was a history of French private life, was published by Pierre-Jean-Baptiste Le Grand Dossi. And it was not about general life, as the title might suggest, <laughs> but about food, although it was originally intended to have a broader scope. But apparently he became so obsessed with the food portion of his writing and research that that took up the whole volume. But what this really indicated was that despite this contest of ideas that was going on as to what direction French cooking should go, there was clearly a sense of French cuisine as being worthy of examination and of historical documentation. Ideas like nouvelle cuisine, literally new cooking, and the idea that cooks should be inventing new recipes to please people's palates had been around since at least the 1730s, as France was trying to uh, seek an identity in the kitchen and at the table. And the concept of cooking as an art was also beginning to tape, take shape, but wasn't yet fully formed. Uh, yeah, I was reading an interesting piece that mentioned that it was interesting that cooking emerged as an art, but other trades that required equal levels of skill and consideration didn't ever quite get to that level. Uh, but as France moved into the 19th century, many of the cooks who had worked in the homes of, up, of the upper class suddenly found themselves without work as the aristocracy fled in the wake of the French Revolution. And those cooks often set themselves up as chefs in their own restaurants in order to make a living. A word on the words cook versus chef at the time. So today the word chef implies a certain level of formal training. And a lot of times it indicates a management position within the kitchen. And there are subdivisions below an executive chef in a modern kitchen. And they follow this established hierarchical system known as the brigade de cuisine. 
But the word chef, which literally means head or chief, wasn't codified as a cooking-related term in the 18th century. It actually wasn't used in the chef de cuisine sense until 1826, according to Merriam-Webster. So when we dip back and forth between chef and cook and speaking of these people who worked as servants in the homes of the wealthy and then set up their own shops, we're really using it more in the chief sense rather than in the formal training of food prep sense. And most people learned the trade of preparing meals informally through an apprenticeship at this point. There was not uh, an instance where there were certifications or established training programs for chefs. If people are curious, the Oxford English Dictionary agrees with Merriam-Webster on this. So we're about to jump back into Karam's place and all this culinary upheaval, but we're going to pause quickly for a little sponsor break before we do. So in the midst of all of this uh, food culture and shifting that we were talking about was young Karem, who worked in the tavern where he was taken in initially for several years and then moved to a restaurant in 1798. And after two years there, he then moved when he was hired in a patisserie run by Sylvain Bailly, where he spent several years learning baking and confectionery. And this was actually the first thing he truly was taught to do in the kitchen. Those previous positions had been more about cleaning up and helping out than actual food prep. And he wouldn't learn to cook a full meal until later. With his employer's permission, he also started educating himself because he hadn't received any formal education as a child. Karem taught himself to read and write over the years from the ages of 13 to 18. And as his reading comprehension got better, he also just started reading voraciously. He studied books on travel and then books about architecture. He also started sketching buildings, and he used these sketches to create centerpieces made with a sugar and gelatin modeling paste called pastillage. He eventually started studying science to gain an understanding of how all the different ingredients combined. Yeah, he was passionate about education his whole life. And there are many instances where if you're reading any biography of him, it will mention how almost his entire life he was constantly running to a library because he just wanted to learn more. And the work that he was doing at Bailly's Patisserie, which was one of the best known and most highly regarded in the city, was largely focused on catering. So Bailly and his staff would prep and deliver baked goods and sweets to large parties and banquets, known as extraordinaires or just extras, uh, hosted by high society patrons. These massive architectural pastillage centerpieces were, I mean, they were big. A lot of times they were more than a meter wide and sometimes even taller. Uh, They gained the attention of heads of state and the aristocracy. Everything from crumbling Greek ruins to pastoral scenes to the Great Pyramids could be found in Karem's repertoire of sugar sculptures. When one of his works of art was made for a ball or a state dinner, a lot of times it was placed at the head table. Yeah, Bailly was, you know, he had a whole staff, but usually if Karem made something for, for any feast, that went in front of the most important people. And Karem made his way up to the position of first pie maker at Bailly's Patisserie, which was basically as far as he could go there. And he attributed his achievements during this time, those masterful centerpieces, his mastery of baking, and his education to a dogged work ethic, later writing, quote, I succeeded in my plans, but how many nights I stayed up in order to do so. Having gotten to the highest position that he could while working for somebody else, Karem transitioned into a new place. He started working in the patisserie of the chef Gendron, and he continued to operate it underneath under that man's name, but Karem was actually the one running things. This move was made with the assurance that he would still be available to work with Bailly on some catering events, And he was once again burning the midnight oil and beyond as he ran his own kitchen, although it was under a different name, and used his name essentially as an artist for hire. Yeah, so it's kind of that thing where someone um, either purchases or gets hired into an established place that has an established recognized name, and it keeps going under their leadership, but it still uses the original name. That was the situation with Jean-Jean. And Karem was right in the thick of the restaurant boom that was happening in Paris in the early 1800s. 
And this really, really excited him. He saw opportunity before him. And soon he actually left Gendron's Patisserie to work in catering full time. He didn't want to be bound by baking exclusively, but instead he wanted to learn about preparing all types of food. And he used his pastry knowledge to open the door to learning more. At massive events that were thrown by the Napoleonic nobility, it was really common for multiple chefs to be employed for the evening to oversee various parts of the meal. And so while managing the pastries, Carême learned cooking from some of the finest culinary talents of Paris while he worked alongside them. Carême soon became the favorite of Charles-Maurice de Talleyrand Perigord, who was Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time. And Carême would often work for Talleyrand for multi-day engagements where lavish spreads were needed. And during this period of near-constant banquet bookings for France's heads of state, Carême opened his own patisserie in his own name, although it seems that this was really more of a kitchen and staging area for food prep for these events than a functioning pastry shop that was open to the public. Through his connection to Talleyrand, Carême began creating dishes for the French nobility. When Napoleon Bonaparte married his second wife, Marie-Louise of Austria, it was Carême who baked their wedding cake. Ever the workaholic, Marie-Antoine Carême somehow made time to write a book when he wasn't feeding government officials and their guests, titled Histoire de la Table Romaine, or History of the Roman Table. No known copies of that text exist, but it is believed to have been a comparison between French and Roman food, with France's fare being determined to be far superior. Carême was, as his eye for creating amazing masterpieces made clear, a visual thinker. And he championed the idea that a dish should look beautiful in addition to tasting good. So when you see people talking about the importance of presentation and plating a dish perfectly, this really comes from Carême's ideology. He wrote about the importance of order at the table in his books on cooking, and he thought that it enhanced the meal. Dovetailing on that idea, he also thought that chefs should look tidy and appealing, and the uniform that he adopted really set the standard that's still in place today. Yeah, that uh, idea of the double-breasted, white, uh, very crisp tunic that is still very, very common uh, was part of his, his concept. And when politics shifted once again in France and Napoleon's reign ended, it marked a significant change for Carême. As he had risen to a position of really high favor within the Napoleonic government and he benefited from the big budgets that their events afforded, that change in government, of course, made for a change in his life. He had massive prestige at this point, though. He didn't need to worry about jobs. Uh, his, his legend had spread far beyond France, but he didn't want to stay in France, even though it was his home. He was definitely aware of his cachet and his fame as it grew. He was not afraid to talk himself up or to accept praise, so he traveled, safe in the knowledge that his reputation would carry him through. At the beginning of the Bourbon Restoration, which spanned the years 1814 to 1830, he was welcomed into the houses of Russia, Austria, and England. And he did very well for himself during this time. His skills in the kitchen were of such renown that he could turn down jobs if he wasn't interested in them because he always had more wealthy patrons looking to book his services. In 1815, he wrote two books. The first... Le Patissier Pittoresque, or Picturesque Pastry, offered basic instructions and designs for the types of sugar centerpieces that had made him famous throughout France and beyond. The second book was titled Le Patissier Royal Parisien, which is Royal Parisian Pastry, and that was much more of a conventional cookbook filled with pastry recipes. In 1816, after spending time abroad and being asked by royal houses and heads of state to become their permanent chef, Carême finally accepted one of these offers. He was employed by George IV of Great Britain while he was still the Prince Regent. One of the most impressive meals during that time was a banquet that was prepared to honor Nicholas, Grand Duke of Russia, when he visited George IV on January 18, 1817. For that event, they created 120 dishes. There were eight different roasts, dozens of entrees, Uh, and eight patisserie centerpieces, including a pastry recreation of the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, where the feast took place. But despite his triumphs in Great Britain, 
That job only lasted eight months before Karem decided that he just could not stand the English weather. He found it too dreary. Uh, And after bouncing around for a while throughout Europe and parts of Russia, Karem ended up back in Paris. We'll talk in a moment about the next high-profile job that Karem took, but we're going to pause again for a quick sponsor break. In 1918, Karem took another permanent, and we have to use the air quotes there, position because he did seem to be a little bit of a a traveler in his heart. Uh, This time it was in St. Petersburg to work for Tsar Alexander I, managing his kitchen staff. Once again, this did not last long. And after that, he worked for a string of people, including the English ambassador to Vienna, Lord Stewart. And Karem actually had a bit of a tricky time connecting with Lord Stewart after the cook had left St. Petersburg. But he did eventually catch up with the ambassador on his travels, and then they traveled together to London for George IV's coronation. But they didn't actually make it there in time, and then they went their separate ways. Uh, Stuart headed back to Vienna in his job, and Kerem once again returned to Paris. In the early 1820s, he published another book, this one titled Le Maître d'Hôtel Français, or The French Maître d'Hôtel. This book featured an essay discussing the merits of old versus new cuisine and a variety of menus based on the calendar. Yeah, it's basically like if you're going to manage... Uh, uh, meals for fine people. Here are some sample menus you could use <laughs> no matter whether you are in the finest houses of Vienna or London or uh, St. Petersburg. He basically kind of used all of that knowledge he had gleaned working in all of these very high-profile places and put together sample menus for someone to follow. I had an instant where I was about to ask you, is this like a seasonal food thing? And then I was like, of course it was because th- this was a an era before so much (laughs) modern technology where you can have seasonal foods year-round a lot of times. Well, and that was actually something, you know, they were obviously, there were ways to preserve and pickle things, but, like, one of the the things that made Talleyrand allegedly, like, really just adore him is that Talleyrand um, challenged him at one point back during the, the reign of Napoleon to create seasonal menus, basically never repeating a dish and always using the freshest fruits and vegetables. And apparently Karim did just a super bang-up job of this. And so everyone was like, wow, he's amazing. He doesn't even need preserves. Like, (laughs) uh, he was really, really good at doing seasonal um, cooking. He did, however, continue to have weird luck with jobs that didn't quite pan out until he began working for financier Baron James de Rothschild in 1824. And he actually worked for Rothschild longer than he had in any other position for five years up until 1829. While he was working for Rothschild, he wrote his first true cookbook called Le Cuisinier Parisien, or The Parisian Cook. The, that book was published in 1828, and he almost immediately started working on a second version of it. He also reopened his patisserie after he finished his work uh, with James de Rothschild. Yeah, we he had made that book of pastry recipes, but this was really like a comprehensive cookbook that included many courses throughout a meal. Um, And Karem was actually busy expanding this book because he really loved it when he died on January 12th of 1833. He died quite young. He was only 48 at the time. And it turned out that all of those years of looking after food that was cooking over a coal fire had really damaged his lungs. Volumes 1 and 2 of that new expanded cookbook that he had been working on when he passed, L'Art de la Cuisine Française au XIXe siècle, which is the art of French cooking in the 19th century, came out later in the year of his death, 1833. The third volume of this came out in 1835, and one of his students finished the last two volumes and published them in the 1840s. His cookbooks are among the first that really show, with step-by-step sketches in a lot of cases, how to create what became French haute cuisine. And But in his mind, these foods were really for the home. His career, which went from working for a business to working as a freelancer at banquets to working in private, though wealthy homes, really traces his evolution of the idea that beautiful, delicious food should be accessible and part of home life. And for clarity, this does not mean that he thought fine food should be simple. He was infamous for concocting really complicated recipes that could take days and days to prepare. Uh, One of the things I stumbled across while I was prepping this was a blog by someone who is... uh, 
pretty versed in French cooking and has done a lot of these. And and they made one of his famous soups, and it took them five days because <laughs> there are so many steps. Uh, and it has a very complicated, even the way it had to be arranged in a shallow soup bowl was laid out very clearly uh, because, again, he was obsessed with presentation. But he really still thought that that information, those recipes, should become a part of the everyday. Karayam's legacy is global and ongoing. It reaches far beyond French food. Just like his concepts of presentation and fine cooking at home persist, even his concrete ideas shape a lot of the dishes we still eat today. For example, he believed in what he called the four mother sauces or grand sauces that formed the basis of all good cooking. And these sauces were velouté, which is made with a simple roux and a stock. So roux, if you do not know, is uh, butter and flour quickly uh, combined in a pan. And then it can be treated different ways. Espanol, which is a brown sauce, which is made with a dark brown roux. Once you combine those things, you let it darken. And then you add beef or veal stock and stewing bones in some cases. Allemande, which is a pale velouté with egg yolks, lemon juice, and heavy cream added to it. And what I believe to be the best one, bechamel, which is a white roux uh, made with milk or cream, which can also have cheese added for variation. Uh, these sauces you could still find made all time. <laughs> well, and it's a it's a common enough idea that like I, like I could not name the four mother sauces off the top of my head, even having heard you just say all four of them. But the idea that there are four mother sauces in French cooking is something that I am aware of, and I am not a French cook by any stretch. Well, and it has actually changed a little bit, right? That list was later amended by um, Auguste Escoffier, who followed in Karem's footsteps. He's going to be an episode all his own soon. Uh, and then there were five mother sauces. So, <laughs> so that shifted, and Allemand shifted to something else. But Karem's basics endure, and they're still used in restaurants throughout the world today. So all this codification, innovation, and style, combined with a really healthy dose of self-awareness, made Marie-Antoine Carême the Western world's first celebrity chef. He even included a sketch of himself in his books way before the concept of an author photo was a thing to ensure that people could recognize him on the street. And that is how he became the so-called king of chefs. I love that he did that. (laughs) I love why he did that. Yeah, I want people to be able to praise me in person if they so desire. (laughs) Do you have some listener mail for us? I do. This listener mail is a little weird in terms of timeline, but it makes sense with today's episode. It is from our listener, Ashley, and she writes, Hello, I know we're almost into April. At this point, we're deep into April, but she wrote this in March. Uh, I know we're almost into April, but I've been getting caught up on episodes and just listened to the historical roots of holiday treats. And I thought I would share my sister's tradition of making intricate gingerbread houses every year. Her family started a few years back making a replica of their house, and it has grown ever since. This year, they did Hogwarts, and I think it was, I thought it was something y'all might enjoy. Thank you for the excellent episode. I am also a huge fan of food stuff, so anytime food and history cross is a huge bonus. Holy Moses, she sent us pictures of this incredible gingerbread house, and I am blown away. One, because this is some of the most, it could just be artfully decorated, but it is some of the most delicate looking gingerbread. Like, I don't, know how much gingerbread anyone has made, but when you start to get thin to get details into it, it's very easy for it to break. And this all looks perfect and sharp-edged, and it's amazing. So thank you so much, Ashley, because this is beautiful, and it ties in beautifully with the idea of Karem's amazing centerpieces. I think he would be pretty impressed by this full Hogwarts model made of gingerbread. I don't know how you even make peace with yourself breaking that apart to eat it when the holidays are over because it is really a work of art. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. You can also visit us at mistinhistory.com. And Mist in History is also our handle across all of social media. If you come to our website, you will find an archive of every episode of the show that has ever existed, as well as show notes for any of the ones that Tracy and I have worked on together. So please come and visit us at mistinhistory.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 